Okay. Good morning. Uh, good to see you again. Good afternoon if you're in Ethiopia. We're going to read God's Word together. Um, we're going to study it. Uh, and this morning, I just want to briefly look for about 40 minutes or so at this Jacob excursus and ask the question, how did Jacob obtain the blessing? How did Jacob obtain the blessing? So we'll just uh, look at the lecture material then. I hope that's a little bit of a better picture today. Uh, but before we begin, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us again. We thank you for the technology we have with Zoom. We pray for grace for speaker and for students. You'd bless us all. You'd help us understand your word better and love it that we may do it and apply it into our own lives and situations. We pray you'd fill us full of integrity. We'd learn from the mistakes of the dishonesty and fleshiness of Jacob that we would seek to live and walk and bear fruit by your spirit as we abide in Christ. May his spirit of truthfulness and integrity fill us in all we say and all we do in the lives we live and the thoughts we have and the words we speak in our moral conduct, both in public and in private, and how we handle money and, and how we serve your church and rule and govern your flock. So grant us all the grace we need. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So then, Here's the question we start with today. Uh, how did Jacob obtain the blessing? Uh, let's just read the account again, which we looked at the other day. And uh, I'll just enlarge this a little. Put it up the well, I'm not because that will mean the program will go off. Uh, spoiled screen share. Apologies for that. So, verse 27 of Genesis chapter 25. This is the word of God. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and left his stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham and Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to, to Egypt, dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and will give you to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice, and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac settled in Gerar. When they, and then there's this episode again about his wife, and we'll move past that. So we come then to chapter 27. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his older son and said to him, My son, and he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old, I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me and prepare for me delicious food. 
such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord. For I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two young goats so that I may prepare from them delicious food for your father, such as he loves and you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah's mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and, shall seem to be, and I shall seem to be mocking him, and bring a curse upon myself, and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice, and go bring them to me. So he went and took them, and brought them to his mother, and his mother prepared delicious food, such as his father loved. Then Rebecca took the best garments of Esau, her older son, with uh, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the sk skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hands of her son Jacob. So he went into his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your, son, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now you sit up and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near me, that I may feed you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to his father Isaac, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are and that he saw, and he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Then he said, bring it near me that I may eat of my son's games and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac blessed him and said to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him, and Isaac smelt the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is the smell of the field that the Lord has blessed. May God give to you the dew of heaven and of, of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine, that people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father, and he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, Who are you? He answered, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought to me? And I ate all before you came. I blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob, for he has cheated me these two times? He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac said to Esau, Behold, I have made him lord over you and all his brothers I have given to him for servants. And with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered him and said, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heavens on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you. 
I planned to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother, and Haram. Stay with him for a while till your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. And I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft of you both in one day? And Rebecca said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women, like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? So let's just move back then to the lecture notes. How did Jacob obtain the blessing? Well, firstly, we see it was by sovereign appointment in verse 23 of chapter 25. Here we're told that when the boy struggled into the womb and Rebecca inquired of the Lord, she was told that two nations in her womb would be divided and that the older would serve the younger. At the moment of birth, the younger grasped the heel of the older brother. It seems from the start, on account of the promise, the mother loved Jacob while the father judged the matter according to the flesh. Uh, chapter 25, verse 28. Let's just rehearse that again. Chapter 25, verse 28. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand, verse 26, holding he saw, he, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she wore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So it was by sovereign appointment. Uh, let's be clear about that. The whole event is controlled by the sovereign Yahweh, the covenant God. Even though people make uh, mistakes, and even though the parents had biases here, uh, even though all acted carnally or unbelievingly in certain respects, God was overseeing it all. Let's be confident of God's sovereign rule and covenant blessing that we seek. And it was by carnal appointment, chapter 25, verses 31 to 34. One day by stealth, Jacob plays on Esau's gut uh, and he snatches the opportunity and makes hungry for food. Esau swear, what use is it birthright? To me, he says, I'm starving. So for a bowl of pottage or stew, he sells him his birthright. Esau despised the birthright. Jacob is to be commended for wanting the birthright, for wanting God's blessing, for craving God's blessing. But the way he went about it was all wrong. It was by sovereign appointment, it was by carnal appetite, it was by divine appointment again. We see in 26, uh, by divine announcement in 26, verses 2 to 6. Isaac is tempted to go to Egypt when another famine occurs, but this time the Lord appears to Isaac in Gerar. It's a uh, Philistine territory belonging to Abimelech, uh, with a promise of wonderful blessing if he stays and remains in the land that the Lord has promised. And um, the promise is restated with three additional features. The promise is restated in a chiastic parallelism. There's going to be national blessing, uh, land, oath, seed, international blessing and you see national blessing international blessing uh, land and seed and right at the center of the chiasmus you remember the the uh, arrowhead ship structure national blessing uh, land and right at the heart the oath and then the seed and the international blessing so God's promises absolutely 
sure and because God has sworn an oath through the seed, they will give the land or to the seed they'll give the land and there'll be a national blessing which ends up an international, global, cosmic blessing because he's heir of the promise that God is going to bless the whole world through Abram's seed. God swears that. There's three additional features. The presence of the Emmanuel principle. God is going to be with us. That's a principle that's found throughout scripture uh, and is culminated and reaches a climax in Christ who's God with us in the flesh incarnate at Bethlehem. So there's the Emmanuel principle presence, the central chaotic oath, and the grounds for confidence. Uh, now, this isn't uh, Abram's works righteousness. He's been justified by grace and God is at work in his life, producing the obedience of faith. This is evangelical obedience of faith in response to God's promise. It's an act of faith. Let's just look at that in 26, uh, 2 to 6 again. And the Lord uh, appeared to him and said, this is Isaac, do not go down to Egypt, dwell in the land of which I shall tell you, sojourn in this land. Here's the Emmanuel principle. I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your offspring, I will give all these lands. I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, to, to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and will give you and give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. That is finally one seed. Remember the seed promise. There's always a individual goal finally of the one seed the promise is in one seed christ but seed has this uh, because it can be singular or plural seed it's not seeds but seed singular seed and plural seed the corporate is included in the individual seed uh, I guess, through union with Christ, we might say in New Testament terms, important always to remember that. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abram obeyed my voice. That is the obedience, not of works, but of faith. God gave his voice. His, vo his, his word was a means of grace. His promise, his, his command of promise, Kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws by grace through faith. When we receive the gospel, we believe the gospel, and we obey the gospel. Both ideas are used in scripture, and that's an evangelical obedience. We trust God's word of grace, uh, and by faith obey. That's what Abram did here. So let's just go back to the lecture then. It was by sovereign appointment, carnal appetite, divine announcement, by fatherly appointment, though through stealth and deceit in chapter 27, 1 through to 46. Despite the prior in-law grief, Isaac is still determined to bless Esau in opposition to the promise, even though Esau has caused all sorts of family problems. Let's just look at those in chapter 26, 34 to 35. 26, 34 to 45. Uh, when Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, to be his wife in Basimat, the daughter of Elam the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. In spite of all the grief and the clear signs that Esau was not a spiritual man, but a carnal man, a, a fleshly man, a godless man, a rebellious man, a disobedient man, 
in marrying outside uh, the people of God and marrying ungodly women who made life bitter for Isaac and Rebecca. It brought trouble to the parents in spite of all that. Uh, he's still determined, isn't he, to bless Esau. That's bad judgment of Isaac's part. And this was in opposition to the promise. He had a, a misplaced affection for Esau. His dim eyesight is deeply ironical uh, because it's kind of a, a parable almost of his own lack of spiritual insight. He just can't see that Esau is not the one to receive the blessing, but God's choices in Jacob. Uh, his fleshly love of game uh, becomes a circumstance and the occasion to bless Esau. But when Rebecca overhears this, she is determined to bless Jacob. Uh, so note the following features about this. It's occasioned by the father's blindness, 27.1. Jacob acts in obedience to his mother's instruction several times in 5 to 10, 13 to 17. Sorry. Uh, 27, 5 to 10. Now, Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Isaac, so when Esau went to the field, Rebecca said to her son, I've heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Now, therefore, verse 8, my son, obey my voice as I command you. That happened on a couple of occasions. If occasioned by his father's blindness, it was in obedience to his mother's instruction. Objections were raised by Jacob. Uh, he said, I'll bring a curse upon myself, and that's the last thing I want. Uh, um, his fears are relieved by his mother, who says, let the curse fall on me. Uh, isn't it a wonderful thing? Uh, I'm not saying... It's a major point of the passage, but it certainly is an illustrative point of just uh, mentioning in passing. Uh, it was Christ who had the curse fall upon him, that we might be blessed when he was cursed at Calvary. Uh, what love. And, and uh, Rebecca is showing love for Jacob here that he might be blessed. Chapter 27, verses 11 to 12. It was occasioned by blindness. It was an obedience to instruction. It was despite objections raised by Jacob and obtained by Jacob's deception in chapter 27, verses 18 to 25. We'll see, I'll not read that again. But let's note a number of things about it. Firstly, lie number one in 27, verse 19. There's a string of lies here, sadly. When asked to identify himself, Jacob deliberately lies. He's motivated by a stated desire to obtain blessing. And it's compounded by his deceptive dish. So he's not just telling a lie, but he's, he, he's dreaming of a whole plan of deception. It, it's just a lie from start finish its deceitful liars, anything which is intended to deceive. Uh, and he does this quite deliberately in a calculated fashion, uh, maybe in the heat of the moment, fearing he might not get the blessing, but now the circumstance, you see, the pressure brings out the urgency. It's now or never, he thinks. He should have waited God's time, but God overruled in a sovereign way, so let's not forget that, in spite of his lies and his sin, though not to excuse him, okay? Uh, he's responsible for his sin, and it was costly. There's going to be years and years and years of pain on this account, where he learns not to deceive. So don't think you, you, you can be dishonest and get away with it. God will chasing you and discipline you if you're his servant and if you're his child. 
Then lie number two in 27 verse 20. When asked how the dish was prepared so speedily, which Jacob perhaps had not reckoned on, be sure your sin will find you out, the scripture says. A liar has to be very accomplished, doesn't he? And cannot cover every base. He doesn't think there's going to be more dishonesty. And so he's going to have to tell more lies. At the very best, he deceives by stating that he had success. So he means to deceive, even if the words could be uh, rather generously interpreted as being simply economical with the truth. He certainly had met success when his mother agreed to provide the meal, but it was a lie. Lie number two. Line number three in chapter 27, verse 21 to 22. When he's requested to draw near by Isaac uh, to be felt, to determine his hairiness, Jacob then steps forward and his father does not recognize him. Uh, verse 23, let's just read that. 27, 21 to 23. Then I have said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you're really my son, he's or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, who felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. No doubt Jacob was terrified of being discovered at this point in time. The sweat was breaking upon him, and he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. So the disguise and the deception worked. At least it, it seemed that way. At least he, he got away with it for the moment. Line number one, two, and three are now blessing and bestowed. Uh, not the order, uh, uh, sorry, note, but the order of, of the material here is not strictly sequential, but is a section heading. Uh, or so sorry, uh, but a section heading is used, and then the unfolding event in particulars are specified. So it's not a strict sequence, it's a section heading. The blessing is bestowed, and then uh, we see uh, what the bestowal of the blessing involved. Often, you get this kind of thing with Moses in the and the truth. He gives the heading, the caption heading at the top, and says he's been blessed. And then you think he's finished with the blessing, but he's actually just started it. That's the heading, and then he outlines the blessing. So we go down and read that the act of blessing was stated in verse 23. It stresses the point that the blessing in Jacob was obtained by default and deceit. Then the subject for blessing is checked, verse 24. When double checked, Jacob deliberately engages in deceit. Let's just have a look at that, 23 and 24. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau hands, so he blessed him. Then he said, are you really my son Esau? There's a double checking. I am, he answered. Then he said, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. And his father Isaac said, come here and kiss me, my son. And he came here and kissed him. He smelt the smell. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine that people serve you. So the blessing comes, cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, so you see that very clearly. So he blessed him, verse 23, then the blessing comes, and then we're told clearly uh, the blessing is finished in verse 30. Meal comes before the blessing is tasted. Verse 25, he brought, he ate, and drank with 
time pressing and tension rising, uh, you expect uh, Jacob maybe hurry, uh, hoped it would be over swiftly, but it, it takes time and all the while Esau's in the background preparing the meal, the pressure's rising, you can feel the tension. Uh, he's desperate for the blessing. Then the kiss of blessing is given in verse 26 to 27. The smell of Esau's garments evoked emotion. There's a word of blessing uttered in 28 to 29. Uh, prosperity, power, preeminence in the family and the pronouncement of blessing. And then the exit before the blessing is uncovered or discovered in verses 30 to 40. Esau now returns, he bewails the fact that he's forfeited the blessing, and is filled with enmity and hatred for his brother. Verse 41, so Rebekah again commands and instructs Jacob, flee to your uncle Laban in Paddan Aram, and you'll be safe there in 42 to 46 or 27, with the consent of Isaac under a false pretext. Yes, she did hope uh, Jacob would have a godly wife, but she used that as an excuse. Uh, how revealing about human behavior, we can say something which is true, but it can actually be a lie intended to deceive. It's a false pretext and cover up. People do that all the time. They want to come across as godly when really they're acting in a deceptive, false, ungodly way. Cherish, man, your integrity above all things so that what you say is really the truth. Don't be deceptive or twisted or tricky like these characters here. And pray for God's grace to make you honest and transparent and sincere. She's deeply insincere here, verses 1 to 5 of 28. Let's just uh, verse uh, 46 of 27. Actually, then Rebecca said to Isaac, I know my life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women, like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? See what she's saying? She's, she's putting the thought in her husband's head. Isaac said, look at the, you, you, you've got to do something about these head-eyed women. Jacob's got to be protected and shielded. Our lives are bad enough. You've got to send them away, husband. Uh, so deceptive. Uh, and so Isaac then called Jacob and blessed him and directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women arise, go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. So Isaac is manipulated here into thinking he has thought about sending Jacob away. Uh, people uh, manipulate all the time. They're very crafty. And yet, in the sovereign will of God, he does it voluntarily. It's his decision, and so he goes with God's blessing, or with his father's blessing, and with God's blessing, of course. Now, it's at this point that Jacob flees to Paddan Aram with the bulk of the rest of the encounter sandwiched in between three appearances of the Lord. That's a Jacob encounter. Uh, at Bethel in chapter 28, at Machanaim in 32, when he comes back, this is not God, but his angels, which must for Jacob have been taken as a kind of seal of approval, reminiscent of Bethel. So the angels come at two camps, Machanaim, that's what the, ver uh, the noun means. Machanaim is a singular camp, and Machanaim is the dual noun, the two camps, and the angels come, and he must say, oh, God's going to bless me. He's approving everything I've done. Uh, he probably takes this as carte blanche uh, to do what he likes in order to obtain blessing. But 
very shortly afterwards, Jacob is in for a jolt and a shock. Pride comes before a fall, and suddenly, uh, at Haniel, he wrestles with the stranger, the angel of the Lord, no doubt, God himself, in the pre incarnate appearance of Christ. It's not Christ according to the, not Christ incarnate in flesh, but a physical manifestation of Christ. The incarnation in Bethlehem is unique. You must remember that about all these the theophanies or the Christophanies in the Old Testament. They're not the incarnation, never that, where the divine nature of Christ is united inseparably forever and irreversibly with the sinless, perfect human nature of Christ, uh, one mediator, one man, two natures without mixture or confusion, looking the properties of humanity and divinity, uh, one personal mediator, uh, two natures, uh, the offices of prophet, priest and king. That's unique about the incarnation. He's still incarnate, though it's now glorified human flesh. So this is followed, Peniel is followed. He enters the lab, lab of the limp now, and is reconciled to Esau. The offering is made, and they part ways again. Uh, this is followed by worship on the Shechem altar named El Elohe, Israel, the God, the God of Israel, his God, in 3320. Swiftly followed by the disastrous defilement of Dinah, which makes Jacob move back to Bethel in 351, Luz being the old name, which is updated, no doubt, by Moses. Uh, with fear falling on those near Luz, which is in the land of Canaan. In spite of all the sin and in spite of all the deceit, in spite of all this disastrous uh, uh, the defilement and then mad slaughter by the brothers, sitting in Levi, uh, Jacob thinks he's become a stench. God protects him and the people of the land fear him and his family. And there an altar is built named El Bethel, or God of the house of God, with the sorrowful death of Deborah, the nurse, Rebecca, uh, eased by a further hearing in his grief uh, after coming from Paddan, Aram. What do we see there? We see a connection. Here, the connection is established with the first appearance before traveling to Paddan Aram. For now, Jacob has come full circle and returned to Bethel. We see covenant. Blessing again is highlighted uh, by a caption heading in 35.9, calling uh, the penial name is restated. Or does this look back and summarize all that has happened to this point? Well, whatever the case, the struggle with the stranger is to leave and has left its indelible mark in Israel forever, which the nation must not forget. The connection, covenant, calling, there's content, the restatement once again of the covenant promise of the seed, the nations and kings, blessing, form of a restated creation mandate, not heard since the days of Adam and Noah, for Jacob is the new Adam. He's not the last Adam, but the new Adam, uh, the one in whom the promises continue, but fall short. You know, they're only fulfilled by me in Christ, and uh, not only seed, blessing, but also land. Jacob is the heir of the promise to Abraham and Isaac as a gift of free grace and not by deception or guilt that comes through promise by the spirit, not the flesh. So Moses makes it clear, this is how the blessing came to a simple exile in Palin Aram, according to God's gracious covenant oath. This is certainly 
not salvation or even sanctification or blessing by works but grace it's all monergistic not synergistic it's all one working power god and there's consecration worship is now offered on the memorial pillar that is erected from a memorial hello a drink offering is poured out in the place where God spoke to Jacob is again named Bethel. So there's a connection, covenant, calling, content, and consecration. Let's just briefly look at chapter 35. Uh, God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob, all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. And as they journeyed, the terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them, so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Remember that same fear fell on cities of Canaan when Joshua came in. Uh, Rahab noted that and told the spies about that and said the same things. Moses is saying, this is what God will do for you when you enter the land. Just as it happened with the patriarch, so it will happen with you. I promised you the land. Go and take possession of it. And Jacob, verse 6, came to Luz at his battle, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him. And there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died and she was buried under an oak below Bethel. So he called its name Alan Bakuther, Oak of Weeping. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. He said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply a nation. And the company of nations shall come from you. And kings shall come from your own body. Israel must have been so encouraged hearing this on or during the wilderness where Moses is seeking to build up faith in the generation who survived, not the generation that fell so much, so that they can take hold of God's promise and trust the Almighty God that they will go and take the land just as Jacob had gone away into exile and come back and now he was in the land. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you and I will give the land to your offspring after you. What encouragement. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it, he poured oil on it. So Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. And they journeyed from Bethel when they were still some distance from Ephrathah. Ephrathah, Rachel went into labor and she had hard labor. So Rachel died and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb. It is a pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. And so we see how he's brought back. And receives the promises by grace through faith. So in conclusion then, just to wrap up, Jacob by fleshly means sought to deceptively wrestle blessing from Esau. But uh, but now, uh, sorry, it's amazing how one letter can make such a difference certainly in the English language but sure it's true also in Amharic. 
Jacob by fleshly means sought to deceptively wrestle blessing from Esau, but now chastened and converted by meeting Laban and Paddan Aram, God graciously bestows blessing according to the prophetic promise prediction of the covenant, not of works, but grace. May we know God's covenant blessing of grace. Uh, so uh, if you have questions, e email them to me and we can discuss them uh, the next time we join up via Zoom. May God bless you. Uh, the next topic, God willing, if we're all spared in Christ, the laser's return uh, will be uh, Joseph.